All right. All right. All right. We're waiting for a couple of people to get in here real quick. Go ahead and smash the like button so more people on YouTube can find this content. Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel and also go ahead and subscribe to the letter that I write every single morning to over 50,000 investors, pompletter.com. I see everyone joining. If you are joining, let me know where you are tuning in from. All right, guys. All right. All right. So here's the deal. Let's get started with uh, what's been going on in the uh, economic crisis. If we go back to uh, really last year, uh, what we saw was a, a situation where um, we had a great kind of uh, late stage economy. There was a uh, stock market all-time highs. There were businesses that were uh, growing really nicely. Um, but we started to see a couple of warning signs. And those warning signs really were things like inverted yield curves, uh, gyrations in the repo markets, uh, a high number of CEOs leaving uh, the companies and stepping down. And so I think what we ended up uh, really kind of feeling was the market was frothy. All of a sudden, we get a public health uh, crisis or the pandemic. That pandemic ends up forcing uh, the governments around the world and here in the United States to mandate a uh, government shutdown or a government mandated shutdown. So what that means is everyone's got to go shelter in place. They need to um, essentially not go to work. And so the velocity of money drastically slowed. Uh, and that velocity of money was um, a really big factor uh, for a while, right? Is if you don't have velocity of money, then how can you possibly have a positive economic situation? It becomes very difficult to do. And so what we saw was when the velocity of money slowed, now, all of a sudden, we get a situation where it exposes the underlying issues in the economy. And so uh, let's just recap. In about March, the second or third week of March, we got these uh, shelter-in-place orders. Since then, we have had over 55 million Americans lose their jobs. Since then, we have seen equity markets, they tanked 30% on average or uh, approximately. We saw Bitcoin drop 50% in a single day. We saw gold go down 12 to 15%, right? All this crazy, crazy chaos. But as soon as that stuff started to happen, as soon as asset prices started to sell off in that liquidity crisis, we immediately saw the government and the Federal Reserve step in and they dipped back into the 2008 financial crisis playbook. And that playbook was to pump asset prices to inject as much liquidity as they possibly could into the economy. And so what you saw was two emergency rate cuts, right? Central banks only have two tools to deal with economic downturns. They cut interest rates twice in an emergency measures all the way down to 0%. So now we had a 0% uh, rate environment. They then decided to do multiple rounds of monetary stimulus, totaling up to about $3 trillion, give or take. And so in 2008, 2009 crisis, we saw hundreds of billions printed. This time we saw trillions printed. And so when you cut rates and you print a bunch of money, what happens is we literally did an about face. So those equities that had fallen 30% basically skyrocketed, right? They fell off a cliff and then they turned around and they skyrocketed as all this uh, liquidity got injected into the market. Not only was that equities though, gold went from down 12 to 15% to today gold is up between 25 and 30%. Bitcoin went down 50% in a single day. Now it's up year to date over 60%. Right? And so what you saw was that injection of liquidity ended up inflating asset prices. At the same time, we saw some anomalies. Right, and So take real estate, for example. In the real estate market, if there was a recession and a pandemic, most people would expect real estate, residential real estate prices to fall off a cliff, right? to, to drop drastically. But instead, we saw something different. We saw the median home price in America actually increase. Why? Well, there's a zero rate environment, so there's cheap capital flowing around. So people are incentivized to go borrow that capital and buy new homes. Uh, and when they do that, uh, that increases demand for new homes. At the same time, there's a U.S. housing shortage. Every year, about 200 to 250,000 homes aren't built that need to be to keep up with demand. And so you have a housing shortage, so the supply side is uh, less than we need. At the same time, you have a drastic increase in demand. And so what you get is you get a drastic increase in price or an increase in price. And so that's what we saw in the housing market. So real estate was strong, even though we were in a recession in the pandemic, we saw equities recover, we saw gold recover, we saw Bitcoin recover, um, and, and kind of we are in the situation where we are today. Now, it's important to call out that right now, there is a very, very big disparity 
between what is going on in the financial markets and the economic re realities on the ground, right? In one side of the world, in the, in the wealthy side of the world, there are people who have made tens of billions of dollars, right? The billionaires in America have made tens of billions of dollars in some cases for a total of almost, uh, or I think it's over now, half a trillion dollars. So the richest people in the United States made over half a trillion dollars so far during this pandemic. The poorest people have lost their jobs. In many cases, they can't pay their rent, they can't pay their credit cards, and they're suffering. So how is it that the rich get richer and the poor get poor? Well, it's because the economic crisis exposes the structural setup of the global financial system. And so what is that, right? This ultimately gets at what can you do at home with your money to benefit from economic chaos and uncertainty, just like the billionaires and the wealthy? Well, so we're clear, this is not financial advice. This is merely an education on how the financial system works. And so key is, first of all, you've got to understand how money works. So when trillions and trillions of dollars is printed, what that is doing is it is making each individual dollar less valuable, right? It's still $1 equals $1, but the value of a dollar is ultimately determines what can you buy. So if, for example, $100 could, um, or let's say $1,000 could buy you a computer, if the value of the dollar goes down, right, the purchasing power goes down, it may now take you $1,500 to buy that same computer. If the value of the dollar was to increase, the purchasing power was to increase, maybe now it would only take $500 to buy that same computer. So the computer still does the exact same thing. It still has um, the exact same value it had previously. It's just whether the dollar is stronger or weaker what determines whether you need more or less dollars to buy that same computer. Now, this usually plays out over decades, so we don't really see it, right? About 2% inflation so over a very long period of time, the cost of things will um, go up, but it, it's not seen on a day-to-day -day basis in the United States. We have a pretty disciplined monetary policy. Where you do see it play out, though, is investment assets. So again, if you go back and you look at in March of this year, we saw asset prices fall off a cliff, and then all of a sudden now we see those asset prices having you know skyrocketed back. If you look... Bitcoin at one point this year was sitting at $8,000. In a single day, it dropped under $4,000, hit $3,800. Today, it's trading at almost $12,000. Over 200% increase in that asset. Liquidity is being injected into this uh, economy at an incredible rate. So what does this mean for people at home? Is Ultimately, what you have to do is you have to understand uh, how to position yourself to benefit rather than suffer in this environment. And so what are the rich people doing? How are rich people making billions in, uh, of dollars during a time when tens of millions of Americans have lost their job? It's simple. The rule is very, very simple. Get out of cash and get into assets. Why? Because the dollar is being devalued systematically and intentionally by the Federal Reserve and people in the government in order to increase asset prices. So this is a, a, a rigged game. Right? What I mean by a rigged game is that there are decisions being made by elected officials and by Federal Reserve officials that says it is important for the stability of our financial system to ensure that financial asset prices do not fall drastically. We need to inflate those asset prices. We need to pump liquidity into the economy. We need to make sure that there's not a liquidity crisis. And so when they do that, those asset prices are explode like we've seen. And so when you're sitting at home, you don't have to be a genius, right? All you have to understand is structurally what is happening and then position yourself to benefit rather than suffer and then allow the market structure to take over. And so what most wealthy people have done over the last four to five months is they have gone from holding cash to buying stocks, buying precious metals, buying real estate, and buying Bitcoin. That's what they've done. And why have they done that? Yes, they have conviction. They've done work on the individual assets that they're buying, right? They've got some thesis as to why they should buy one over another. But ultimately, what's driving their decision is the understanding that if I hold a bunch of cash, that cash is going to be devalued and asset prices are going to increase. So in most cases, gold's value has not changed from March to today. What is, what is different about gold? Nothing. What's different is the macro environment and the value of the dollar. 
That's why gold's price price has increased, right? The value hasn't changed, but the price has changed. And the reason the price has changed is because there was an increase in demand for an asset that's harder to get than something that's fully available. And also the dollars being devalued. And so you see the gold price go up. So what about real estate? Remember what I said, the value of the dollar is decreasing and there's a shortage and increase in demand because cheap capital is available. So what happened? The median home price for residential homes in the United States went up. Look at stocks. Stocks saw the dollar being devalued and they saw an increase in demand because when the stimulus checks went out, there's a bunch of data that shows that a bunch of people who took the quote unquote free money in the stimulus checks turned around and put it into the stock market. Stocks go up. And so that is what quote unquote rich people are doing. They understand structurally how the market works and they're positioning themselves to benefit from it. And if you are sitting holding cash, you're going to get crushed. If you go back to 2008, 2009 financial crisis, what we know is that the official CPI numbers, which is a measure of inflation, never got above 2%. But those are the official numbers that measure the consumer prices, right? the, the goods. What we should be paying attention to is two things. There's one nuance. Inflation does not hit every socioeconomic um, kind of basket or, or bucket equally. So the top 20% of people in the world, they actually experience very low levels of inflation at all times. The bottom 20% of people can experience very high levels of inflation. There are multiple studies that show uh, and forecast that people in the bottom 20% of populations experience between 6 to 10% inflation coming out of 2008, 2009. They live paycheck to paycheck, and they don't have a lot of investable assets. And so if you don't have investable assets and you live paycheck to paycheck, then I think what ends up occurring is you are going to experience inflation at a different level than people who have all investable assets, right? Most rich people don't have a lot of cash sitting around. They're sitting in financial investments. Those investments appreciate over time. Why is the stock market literally, it just looks like a 45 degree angle up and to the right over decades. How is that possible? Well, it's because it's not necessarily that the stocks are getting more valuable. It's the fact that the U.S. dollar is being systematically devalued and the, the price of those stocks are increasing because of inflation, right? If you denominate the stock market in gold, stocks are down or equal to 1971, 1972. If you denominate the stock market in Bitcoin, stocks are down drastically. So it's all about a price is a numerator and a denominator. And depending on what denominator you use depends on your perspective as to what gains in value and what decreases in value. And the stock market, although when you zoom out and you denominate in dollars, it looks like a 45 degree angle up and to the right. Kind of you've probably heard that stocks uh, appreciate on an eight to 9% compounded uh, rate annually. That's not necessarily because the stocks are doing that. It's because the dollar is being devalued. And so holding cash ends up being a punishment in the financial system we live in today. And so rich people are not holding cash. They get out of cash and into investable assets. Now, many people will say, wait a second, I don't have a lot of cash. I don't have a lot of investment assets. How can I go ahead and take the little cash that I have and get started today? The first key is there are four key principles or four timeless financial pieces of um, guidance that you should uh, listen to. And they're timeless because they've been true for decades and decades and decades. The first, spend less than you make. It's that simple. If you spend more than you make, you can't make good financial decisions. If you spend less than you make, you have money to invest, to save, to, to make good, sound financial decisions. So spend less than you make. The second is have multiple streams of income. Don't be dependent on a single one. A bunch of people just got the crash course on the idea. They had one stream of income, their job. They lost their job. Bam, now they have no income. If you have multiple streams of income and you spend less than you make, that will solve a very high percentage of your financial problems. Multiple streams of income, say, uh, spend less than you make. The third thing that they do is that they have a very long time horizon, and that long time horizon comes with a lot of discipline. And then the fourth rule, is to simply get out of cash and get into real assets so that you can benefit from inflation rather than being punished by it. It's not that hard. If you can get out of cash and you can get into investable assets, you will see the price of those investable assets increase in price over long periods of time because inflation will inflate the value of that asset. 
And so that's the game. Spend less than you make, have multiple streams of income, have a very long time horizon and be disciplined, and then simply get out of cash and get into investable assets and let the market structure take advantage or, or go to work for you. That's it. That's the whole game. And so I think that now what we're starting to see is people are, are digging into it and saying, okay, I got it. I'm going to spend less than I make. I got multiple streams of income. I want to start investing. What should I look at? And so earlier this year, I wrote a piece and I basically broke down all the different asset classes. And what we're seeing today is we're seeing three separate things, right? Or three things that I personally think are interesting. The first is Bitcoin is the winner in 2020, right? It has been, I've just been saying this over and over and over again. I'm literally like banging my head into the wall. Keep saying this to people. Bitcoin is up over 60% this year, year to date. So pre-pandemic in January to today, Bitcoin is up 60%. It's not 60% off the bottom, right? It's up 60% year to date. And why is that? Interest rates got cut, money got printed, and Bitcoin is the only provably scarce asset in the world. So of course, it is going to do well when you are devaluing an unlimited supply asset like the US dollar, people are going to rush and they're going to look for other types of assets. So Bitcoin's done very well. Gold. Gold has done well. It's up 25 to 30% year to date. That means that gold went into the crisis. It saw it draw down 12 to 15% and now has recovered back to pre-pandemic levels plus 25 to 30%. Why? It is seen as a traditionally scarce asset. And I say traditionally scarce because the belief was that gold was scarce. What we are now seeing is when you compare gold and Bitcoin, gold actually is not scarce at all. We don't know what the total supply of gold is. We don't know what the circulating supply of gold is. And we know that more gold can be made through a chemical process or through a scientific process. We also know that gold, which is created by stars, is very abundant in space. And so gold compared to Bitcoin, Bitcoin is provably scarce. Gold is believably scarce. So there's a difference there. But both of them are doing well because people are rushing out of the dollar and they're rushing into sound money or, or inflation hedge type assets. The, set, the third asset, equities. When you have assets that have drawn down, right? If you take things like in Q2, Lyft lost 60% of their revenue year over year. When you look at something like Southwest Airlines, 80% of their revenue gone, right? These companies have lost so much that if you have deep conviction in a specific type of company or a specific sector, and you say, I have a five or 10 year time horizon, then you're able to buy an asset today that has traded down because the financial performance of it is down. Now, in many cases, many of these companies are actually overvalued, even though they're down off of their all-time highs, right? So if you all of a sudden buy a stock that's down 20%, but revenue's down 60%, you're still buying an overpriced asset because the company is not actually worth only 20% off of its high. It's actually worth 60% off its high, maybe more. And so you got to be careful about just looking and saying, oh, pre-pandemic, this stock is down 20%. That's a discount. I'm going to go ahead and buy it. You have to look at what is the fundamentals of the asset today when you're buying it. And so in many cases, what you end up seeing is that these assets are still overvalued, but people are buying them. They're going to continue, as long as there continues to be quantitative easing, you're going to see stocks in general over a period of time continue to be inflated because that is what happens when you have quantitative easing. Then you move into things like real estate. Real estate is super interesting to me for a couple of reasons. The first thing is, uh, one, that you get uh, all sorts of commercial real estate. So Commercial real estate in New York City has been absolutely decimated. Same with places in LA, San Francisco, Miami, you know, most major metros. When I walk down the street here in New York City, literally two to four retail stores on every block are they're done. They're either shut down, they are shutting down, or they have signs up that say for lease. Like this is a complete reset in the retail commercial real estate uh, market in New York City. If you look at apartments, there is more empty apartments. There's more inventory on the market today than ever before in New York. And there, there's a whole reason behind it. There was this uh, huge influx of international investment capital that came in. Builders saw that. They started to build aggressively. By the time they actually got the buildings built, you know, 18 to 36 months later, the investment capital had dropped off. So there was already kind of a bunch of inventory. Then you slap on the pandemic, a bunch of people fleeing the city. And so now you end up having all this inventory uh, with very little demand. And so prices start to drop. Then you look at residential real estate. 
the median home price has gone up. Why? Housing shortage, demand increase uh, because of uh, cheap capital. And so you're naturally going to see that going up. My guess is that we will continue to see the trends in real estate that we're seeing today accelerate over the coming months. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in five or 10 years, right? I do believe businesses will go back. I do believe commercial real estate will um, kind of regain its footing. I do believe that we will see um, uh, retail uh, real estate also um, come back. Now, with that said, where are the opportunities in real estate? I think one, cloud kitchens, very, very interesting. Two, all sorts of warehouses, very interesting in terms of being able to service e-commerce hubs or, or delivery hubs. Uh, the third thing is malls. I do believe that we are going to see, um, I'm sure many people saw the news with Amazon trying to basically take over department stores and use them as um, kind of these, uh, the, these warehouses or e-commerce uh, delivery points. I think what would be very interesting is for somebody to basically buy out a, uh, an old mall uh, that's been suffering. So you buy it at a discount and then you basically build, rebuild it or reimagine the idea of a walkable city, right? You could imagine if you get the right type of real estate, you could literally build a new type of uh, walkable city uh, within the mall infrastructure. So real estate's super interesting to me. Uh, and then lastly, something I've been paying more and more attention to is the art market. So one of the details that a lot of people don't know about uh, when it comes to the super wealthy, I'm not talking about you know millionaires or multimillionaires. I'm talking about people that are worth billions of dollars. Usually, a material part of their net worth is in the art market. So Leon Black, David Geffen, etc. They usually have you know somewhere around 20 percent. So call it you know 10 to 30 percent of their net worth in in the private art market. And so what is that again? It is a scarce asset that serves as a great inflation hedge, and they're simply getting exposure in the private market where there's a lot of dislocation and lack of efficiency, right? There's, there's no order book, and what they end up doing is they end up making a lot of money that way. And so ultimately, what we continue to see from rich person to rich person to rich person is they own equity, they own alternative assets, and they simply allow the market structure the idea that the dollar is going to be devalued over time to work in their favor. They position themselves to benefit and not to suffer from that inflation, from that quantitative easing of trillions of dollars. If you sit in cash and you simply keep getting paid paycheck to paycheck with no investable assets, your purchasing power is going to get destroyed over the next three to five years. It will get destroyed. And so you have to protect yourself. And protecting yourself isn't just go buy Bitcoin. It is simply getting in a position where you can keep enough cash for a rainy day, whatever that number is for you. Some people that may be one paycheck, some people that may be three months, that may be six months, whatever your number is, where you feel comfortable having your rainy day cash, everything else you got to go invest. And if you do it correctly and you have a long time horizon, the asset prices will continue to increase because of inflation. So I'm going to start taking questions here in a second. Before I do that, a couple of housekeeping items. One, smash the like button, that thumbs up. Hit that button so more people on YouTube can find this content. Two, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Three, I write a daily letter every single morning to over 50,000 investors. Please, please, please subscribe. I'm going to drop the, um, uh, the URL right now in the chat. Uh, if you subscribe, I write about this stuff every single day. Absolute no-brainer. Uh, also, if you want, drop your questions in now. I'm going to start answering as many of these as I can. So let's go. What? Um, always thought that it would be cool to make old malls and living quarters and apartments. Yeah, this is a no-brainer. So my whole idea here is if you think of what a city is, a city basically has um, – uh, living space. It has retail space. Uh, and then it kind of has outdoor areas, parks, all that kind of stuff. That's essentially what a mall is on a smaller scale. So you could literally take the department stores, turn them into apartment buildings, right? Um, you could take all of the retail stores, continue to have those uh, operate as retail or, or kind of uh, consumer endpoints. So you could have everything from food to shopping, all of that stuff right there. And then you basically take the surrounding uh, parking lot or parts of it, and you basically can turn it into really nice walkable parks or, or whatever. And so to me, it's like a no brainer to go in, buy uh, very kind of depressed priced uh, malls, uh, or even um, somebody may go in and buy like an old university uh, property or something and go ahead and turn that into a, um, a kind of mini city, if you will. Uh, I think that'll become popular. So we'll see there. Um, let's see. 
Should the gold miners invest in rocket ships so they can go to space? Uh, yeah, look, people are obviously becoming more and more aware of the idea that, yes, gold exists in space. Uh, yes, it is on asteroids. Uh, ultimately, what ends up happening is just gold itself is actually uh, created by stars. Um, and I think that uh, people, as they kind of wake up to that, um, you know, they, they like to joke around about how do you go get the gold out of space. But yes, that that is how gold um, is widely thought to uh, to have come into creation. How can we invest in commercial real estate uh, for newbies? Coming from Joseph, uh, look again. I'm not going to give kind of direct um, kind of financial advice or anything, but uh, I would say that most people, if they want access to some sort of commercial real estate, they'd either do it through a REIT structure um, or, or some sort of financial vehicle where they're not actually going out and trying to buy the commercial real estate themselves. Um, you know, it's just it's expensive, it's time consuming. You got to go do the work. If you don't know what you're doing, you can buy the bad asset, all that kind of stuff. Um, but but if you go ahead and actually just do it through some sort of financial structure. Uh, I think that, um, that that's probably the most popular way. Uh, thoughts on the collectible cards market as an inflation hedge. Uh, prices have been going through the roof the last few months. Uh, yes. Um, so I know that a lot of people are talking about and, and uh, investing in the trading uh, sports card market. So whether it's basketball cards, baseball cards, whatever it is, uh, I've done um, a little bit of work on this. I've talked to uh, a number of people who are some of the biggest investors in the space, from what I understand, um, and uh, and they've been very gracious with their time to uh, to answer some questions and, and help me kind of just get up to speed in terms of what's going on there. Uh, I personally have not actually bought anything yet. Uh, I feel like there is a uh, somewhat of a learning curve. Curve, um, that I, I just don't have an advantage. And so uh, I understand kind of why the market is uh, is going up. Um, there's a little bit of uh, some of the same things that happen in, in crypto. Um, but, but just at this moment, I haven't bought anything yet. Uh, I do think it's interesting. I do think that um, if you know what you're doing and you're kind of disciplined, uh, you can find good investments there. I've got a number of friends who, who, who have done pretty well, uh, but it's just not something that I, I feel like I have an advantage or some kind of information um, that, that uh, makes sense for for me. So that's kind of my take there. Uh, in your opinion, what threat does quantum computing pose to Bitcoin in the next five to 10 years? Uh, I literally think quantum computing is not a threat to Bitcoin at all. Uh, one is as the computing power increases, so will the defenses to that computing power, uh, first of all. Second of all, if you have a quantum computer um, there's a lot of other things that are likely to be attacked before Bitcoin um, in terms of getting state secrets, all that kind of stuff. Uh, third is if you attack Bitcoin, the game theory then suggests that you would destroy the value of it. So there's not really a way to uh, financially profit from it. And therefore, uh, it's kind of one of these things where like maybe somebody gets hold of a quantum computer that could actually destroy the Bitcoin network and they for some reason want to do that uh, without having financial gain seems kind of unlikely, maybe a state actor. But again, I think that uh, we're pretty far away from that. And also um, things can kind of become quantum computing proof um, as that uh, technology is also developed. So not really uh, too, too worried about it. Um, yeah. So I see a lot of people talking about scams they're seeing on the internet. Uh, here's a quick um, kind of uh, best practices, if you will. One is uh, never, ever, 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 ever send money uh, or Bitcoin or Ether or whatever to an address under the promise that somebody's going to send you back more. That is a scam. Don't do it. Two is if somebody communicates with you on a social media platform about sending them money, don't do it. It's not that hard. Um, and what you really want to do is you just want to do your research um, and, and make sure that you're not getting scammed. Um, let's see what other questions, what other questions do we have here? Uh, do you think the situation now is a bubble and a major correction is upon us, uh, from Tommy? So I don't know necessarily if this is actually uh, a bubble as much as the way that I think about this is, uh, it's very clear that, um, there's trillions of dollars being injected into the economy, uh, that is inflating asset prices. And the big question, right? If somebody said to me right now, what's the most important question thinking about uh, the economy and investing is can the government and the Federal Reserve continue to inflate asset prices long enough for the economy to recover? My guess is they cannot. And what I mean by that is every time that they announce trillions of dollars of monetary stimulus now, it's going to become less and less effective. And when they thought that, oh, this is only going to be a few weeks uh, kind of problem, if you notice when they set the program expiration dates, so the unemployment, the additional beefed up unemployment ended in July, 
the PPP money. As long as you hold people and you don't fire them until the end of September, then you can get a forgivable loan, right? All of that stuff was set to expire kind of uh, in Q3, give or take. And so that's basically when they thought that this was all going to be over. There was no way we could get to this point, right? There's kind of going to be this, uh, you know, four to six week lockdown. We were going to get rid of the virus and then we we're going to move on. And in order to bridge that gap, right, I call this bridge the gap stimulus. Uh, they set up those programs. Well, obviously here we are uh, in August and the, that stimulus has one not bridge the gap because we still have the public health crisis. We still have lockdowns. We still have the mask mandates, right? We, in some places we still have shelter at home, all that kind of stuff. And so they either have to one, allow that stuff to run off. And then we have to deal with the economic realities that are underlying it. Cause there's no kind of um, inflection or uh, injection of liquidity or two, they can do another injection of liquidity. And what they're trying to negotiate right now is another injection. Uh, the problem is the Republicans only wanna do $1 trillion. The Democrats wanna do $3 trillion. Uh, and they literally are acting like little kids uh, who can't come to a compromise. And so uh, it, most people who are paying attention know this, but if you're not paying attention, they're not even negotiating right now. They're literally both sitting on their hands, staring at each other saying, well, I'll come to the table when you pre-agree to X, Y, Z. And that's just not how you get things done. And so unfortunately, we've got a bunch of politicians acting like children. And while they're acting like children, that ends up meaning that the American people are the ones who suffer, right? And so literally the tens of millions of Americans who lost their jobs recently, if you were trying to get unemployment, you don't have that additional beefed up unemployment insurance. There's a lot of things that um, kind of aren't happening because we have politicians who are frankly just being little kids. So that's the, uh, that, that's the problem. Um, Let's see here. What other questions? Uh, do I think that depositing stable coins on a crypto exchange that offers interest returns is a good idea? Um, so I'm an investor in BlockFi, obviously. Uh, they offer up to 8.6% APY on their interest bearing account for stable coins. Um, for those that don't know, the way that this works is uh, when you deposit dollars in your bank, your bank takes those dollars and they lend it out, sometimes with leverage, so they could lend it out five, six, seven, eight times. Uh, they earn interest off those loans. They then take a portion of that interest and they pay you. That's the interest you earned in the account and the bank takes the spread. So let's say they get paid 3%. They give you 0.05%. They take the spread. Uh, you get 0.05% in your kind of checking account uh, and, they and they take the difference. Now, the thing is that there's risk associated with that. And so there's FDIC insurance uh, to give you the peace of mind to deposit up to $250,000. And even if the bank screws up or the loan goes bad, basically the government or FDIC uh, insurance will, uh, will shore you up. In crypto, there's no such thing as FDIC insurance today. And so they're doing the exact same thing. You deposit uh, a stable coin or cryptocurrency, they take it, they lend it out, uh, they earn interest, and then they come back and they share a portion of that interest with you. Most of the crypto lenders are sharing a majority uh, with the uh, depositors um, and then taking a small spread for themselves. So kind of the, the, the different approach, whereas in the legacy world, the bank takes majority and the depositor gets a very small percent. Here, the depositor is getting majority and the, the um, you know, organization that's providing the software to do that, they're taking a small percent. Now, the difference, there's still risk, right? Just like in the banking system, there's just no FDIC insurance. And so you got to make sure you do your own research, understand how it works. But what I also tell people is like, don't go put 100% of your money into an interest bearing account. Right? Don't do that in the legacy finance system and also don't do that uh, in the crypto system either. And so I put about, I can't remember exactly, but somewhere in like the 10 to 15%, I think, uh, range in terms of uh, how much um, you know, I, I've kind of allocated to interest bearing accounts. So it's a material percentage, but uh, it's not like if something goes wrong, then all of a sudden I would lose uh, kind of all of, uh, all of my assets there. And so that's kind of how I think about it. I, I generally think, uh, you know, don't listen to what I say, just kind of watch what I do. I've got 10, 15% uh, and uh, I, I basically think of it that way. Uh, do I think the US dollar will ever have a valuable backing again? Uh, no, I don't. I know that there's a lot of people who believe we can return to a, a gold standard. I think, frankly, that that is a complete dream. Um, I do not see us ever going back to the gold standard. Uh, and mainly it's because we've got a government that now is addicted to uh, their ability to control and manipulate the economy, right? If you remember in uh, 1971, 1972, when uh, we decided to go off the gold standard, it was, tech it was technically a temporary measure. We were temporarily going off the gold standard, but we were going to go back. 
And then we just never went back. And so once you get uh, kind of a, a taste of the power and the control uh, that you have in printing money and quantitative easing or tightening, uh, then all of a sudden what you see is uh, there, there's no desire to go back, right? There, there's nobody in, uh, in Congress or in the government that's pounding the table saying we have to go back to a gold standard. In fact, they're saying the exact opposite. They're saying we need to print more money. We need to cut interest rates or we need to go negative. Um, and, and so I think that uh, generally humans suck at understanding what we're um, you know, the fact that like we shouldn't do things sometimes, right? That one of the, the flaws of humanity is we feel like the only way to have control over a situation is to do something. Sometimes it might actually be better not to do anything at all, but because we've gotten that taste of that, I don't think we'll ever go back uh, to a gold standard. Do I think that the US dollar would be pegged to Bitcoin? Absolutely not. Uh, I think what's much more likely is that Bitcoin just ultimately uh, increases um, uh, kind of from a market cap standpoint, eventually assumes the role of global reserve currency. Uh, it does that without any country actually kind of putting the stamp of approval. It's just the people start using it um, as, as a cross-border currency or native currency to the internet. And there you go, you end up... Uh, seeing um, exactly what, uh, what what you can do there. Uh, do I see some kind of Fed coin actually happening? Uh, absolutely. I think that we'll see a digital dollar in the next 24 months. Um, I think we'll also see a digital euro, a digital yen, a digital, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so I think that uh, it, it's going to get to the point where every single currency in the world will be digitized, whether that is a private currency like a Libra, a JPM coin or whatever. Uh, every single fiat government controlled currency will be digitized. Um, so that's the digital dollar, digital wand, whatever. Uh, and then also the decentralized currencies are obviously digital as well. And so what that does is it removes any competition at the technology layer. People aren't going to end up um, kind of choosing a currency because of this technology or that technology. Uh, most of them will basically be a uh, feature um, kind of parity, right? They all kind of do the same thing. Where the competition will exist is at the monetary policy layer. So basically, what is the monetary policy of this currency? And that's how I'm going to choose whether uh, I want to use it or not. And so ultimately, that's where I get the idea that I think uh, Bitcoin specifically will, uh, will reign supreme. Um, the, the system that we have today, remember, in the fiat system, if you are a saver, you are punished. And if you are an investor, you are rewarded. So we ask people to go to work every day, whether you're a fireman, a teacher, a middle manager somewhere, you work on a, a, in a manufacturing facility, whatever it is, we ask you to be great at your job, do your job. And then when you go home, oh, by the way, we also need you to be an investor. We need you to become a professional investor to protect your wealth. Not to make more money, but just to protect your wealth. Because if you just sit with your cash in your bank account, you will lose money over time. You actually become poorer over time, even though you actually, it says the same number in your bank account. We can't have a system like that. That's how you get wealth inequality. That's how the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And the system, that is a feature of the system. It's not a bug of the system. Wealth inequality is a feature of the system. And so the best way to do it is to have a great reset. That great reset, I believe, is to go to uh, a fixed supply asset like a Bitcoin, uh, where now all of a sudden, all you have to do is go to work, be great at your job. When you get paid, simply save your currency. You do not have to be an investor. You can simply hold that currency and it will continue to accrue value over time because you did what you were supposed to do. You earned a living, you spent less than you made, and you simply saved, right? But in today's fiat system, savers are punished, investors are rewarded, and therefore you have to be good at your job and you have to be a good investor in the new system. I believe that savers will be rewarded. And so that's where I think that Bitcoin itself will uh, become incredible valuable. Um, <clears throat> yep, I see Jan saying, uh, you aren't even beating inflation, keeping your money in the bank. That's the big problem. Um, and, and so I think we're seeing that on steroids right now, which is uh, the wealthy, they're investing in assets. Uh, and uh, frankly, people who are less fortunate, they're sitting with cash, they're getting paid paycheck to paycheck. Um, and uh, in many cases, that stimulus money is not being invested. They're simply holding on to it. They're spending it, they're doing whatever. Um, and, and so you got to get out of cash. You got to get into investable assets. Make sure you got enough cash for a rainy day. But once you can get to that point, then you got to start investing. And, and uh, another kind of trick that the wealthy understand uh, is pay yourself first. So when you get that paycheck, before you pay your rent, before you do any of this stuff, pay yourself first. Make sure that you're saving, even if it's a hundred bucks a month, right? Save the money. And what I mean by saving is you put it into an investable asset. So whether you're buying stocks, whether you're buying a precious metal, wh whatever you want to do, do your own homework, figure out what your plan is, but make sure that you are not spending more than you make, and also make sure that that money that you are saving is not just sitting in cash. You need to put it to work uh, because if you don't, inflation is going to eat the hell out of it. And ultimately what this gets at is, again, don't take my word for it. Multiple Federal Reserve uh, folks now are talking about 
going over the 2% uh, target inflation. So for those that don't know this, uh, the Federal Reserve basically has a inflation target set 2%. Uh, they've only hit that three of the last 10 years in terms of they've been plus or minus within, I think it's 20 basis points uh, of that 2%. So they're not very accurate at hitting that rate. Um, but now what they're talking about is basically injecting so much liquidity in the economy that they can drastically uh, increase inflation, right? Create a highly inflationary uh, environment and allowing the economy to overshoot the 2% target before they ever do anything. So ultimately what happens is they believe that they have such intimate control over this system that they're going to allow inflation to get over 2% in the CPI official numbers, which means actually the bottom 20% or the bottom 40% of Americans will probably be experiencing between 10 to 20% inflation, right? So if the, if the actual official numbers say 2%, that means that the bottom 20% is probably closer to 10%. And if they overshoot it, if they get to two and a half, three, four percent then all of a sudden the bottom 20% is probably experiencing more than 10%, some, somewhere between 10 to 20% inflation. So they are literally talking about and openly discussing the idea that they are going to inflate away the wealth. They're going to steal the wealth of the bottom 20 to 40% of Americans simply to create a more inflationary environment so that we can continue to see asset prices rise. They're literally talking. If you hear them talking about creating a highly uh, inflationary environment, what they're saying is we're going to take the wealth from the poor and we are going to inflate asset prices and the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poor. Of course, that wouldn't be a very popular strategy if they said that. But if you use big fancy words like we're going to create a highly inflationary environment, we're going to overshoot our targets before we ever do take any action, blah, 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 whatever, then people are just, oh, yeah, whatever. You know, the, the smart rich people are talking. No, time out. When you create highly inflationary environments, you steal the wealth of the bottom 20 to 40% of Americans and you enrich the wealthy. So if you are in the bottom 50% of Americans, 45% of Americans own no stocks and 50% of Americans can't come up with $400 payment for an emergency. If you're in that group, you can't wait around for the government or the Federal Reserve to do things to protect your wealth. That's not their job. The Federal Reserve's job is to manage an economy. It is not to protect you. As I always say, you have to get educated. You have to look out for yourself. No one is going to look out for you like you will look out for yourself. And so in order to protect yourself, you have to invest capital. You cannot get caught holding cash because it's going to get eaten away. So you have to get into investment assets, stocks, precious metals, uh, Bitcoin, real estate, whatever you want. Do your own research, make your decision, but get into those assets. All right. Uh, this is super good for people with huge mortgages, though. Of course, they're all uh, remortgaging or refining their uh, their homes, uh, and they're trying to figure out all kinds of different stuff. Um, let's see what else here. Uh, what else? Um, some of your questions. Some of your questions. I'm going to stick around for another 15 minutes. Uh, uh, when they do that, uh, oh, when they increase inflation, they are also trying to increase velocity of money. Yes, they're trying to increase velocity of money. The problem is that they have no control over that velocity of money, meaning that they can create highly inflationary environments. Um, but what ultimately occurs is uh, just because there's high levels of inflation doesn't mean that velocity of money actually returns. And what you end up seeing is that certain or uh, groups of people have high psychological damage uh, or scarring because they're the ones who just lost their jobs. They're the ones who actually just got hurt the worst. And so then they get caught in this mindset, right? If you think back to 2008, 2009, there's an entire generation of people who literally got most of their wealth crushed in 2008, 2009 that were older. And so if you were a baby boomer, you maybe got wiped out by 2008, 2009. You're about probably 50, right? 50 to 60 years old. Now, all of a sudden you look and you say, wait a second. So the had a severe, significant financial situation. And right when coming out of the 2008, 2009 crisis, let's call it sometime between 2012, 13 is when they kind of started to say, okay, maybe we're recovering, but they were really, really close to their chest with assets from uh, the, the bottom of the markets called 2009, 2010 till like 13, 14 and into 15. And then right as baby boomers started to say, okay, you know what? I think that market's back. And they started to invest. They started to invest at the top of the market. And they started to invest more and more and more and more into 17, 18, and 19. And then in 2020, when we had the pandemic, the pandemic-related 
drop in the stock market. There's a bunch of data coming out now that shows the people who sold their stocks at the bottom of the market were the oldest generation. Why? They have the shortest timeline. They thought that it was going to take such a long period of time for the uh, stock market to come back. So they basically said, I'll take a 30% haircut on my assets. I'd rather have the cash now than lose 50%. And right when they sold those assets, bam, the market recovered. And so they should have just held it. But because of their age, the lack of time, they were forced to make decisions. When they made those decisions, it was a, a kind of 10 to 15 year trend. So those people got hurt in 2008, 2009. They stayed close to their chest uh, with their assets. They were very stingy. They didn't do a lot of investing. They missed a majority of the bull market that we've had over the last decade. And then right near the top, kind of 17, 18, 19, they started to really get comfortable again. Remember, oh, these are the good times. They started to invest, invest, invest. Bam, stock market gets crushed. As soon as the stock market gets crushed, they sell their assets. They got a short time period. And now the market recovers. So they basically have gotten shaken out of their wealth almost twice in the last 12 to 13 years. Absolutely incredible. People aren't talking about it, but there's an entire generation of people who fell victim to the one thing in the world, which is don't react to short-term price movements. But that's what happened. All right. Um, what else? What else? What else? Do I think institutions will buy Bitcoin or a Bitcoin derivative like, uh, I don't know, uh, GBTC, I think that's what I'm supposed to say. Uh, how does that affect prices? Uh, for the most part, uh, institutions were not involved in Bitcoin whatsoever um, until, let's call it, you know, 2019, 2020. And yes, there were some institutions here and there who put small amounts of money in, but for the most part, uh, there was no real institutions. I'm talking about institutions with hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to play with. And so what you saw was retail industry, the retail investors, retail holders, they built and created a $200 billion market cap asset. Now, Gold is eight, nine trillion dollars, whatever it is. Some people think it's ten trillion dollars, you know, whatever the number is. So let's, let's just use eight trillion as the number. If you look at Bitcoin, it's at a two hundred billion dollar market cap, which means that it would have to what is that forty x? Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, forty x. It'd have to forty x to get to gold's market cap. Institutions will help drive that, right? And ultimately, what I think you're going to see is you're going to see institutions realize that gold is or that uh, Bitcoin is superior to gold, and we're going to surpass the gold market cap. So. Just that alone. I don't know how long that takes, right? But institutions are going to be helpful in doing that. I, do, I don't think retail investors um, and kind of retail holders can push us up uh, to kind of the levels of the gold market cap. So you're going to need institutions to come in. The good news is that institutions, just like individuals, are paying attention. They're like, wait a second, I'm exposing myself to uh, inflation. I can't just sit in cash. And therefore, they're looking for inflation hedge assets. Bitcoin has become a more popular option. Whether that's somebody like a Paul Tudor Jones coming out and saying, wait, I need inflation hedge assets. I think Bitcoin will be the fastest horse. I'm going to go ahead and invest there. Or that is, um, you know, we've got two public pensions uh, at Morgan Creek that uh, that have anchored our funds um, that have basically said, hey, look, we think that this is super interesting, disruptive, innovative, um, and, and potentially can create some value. So we want to get exposure uh, to also now you're starting to see groups like Renaissance Technology uh, put into some of their regulatory filings. That they want to be able to trade this stuff. Uh, you see Fidelity setting up an entire digital business. Like this stuff's not going away and it's not going to be less valuable in five or 10 years than it, uh, it is today. It's only going to get more valuable. Only more people are going to get interested in it, right? And so I think that ultimately you're going to see institutions come in. You're going to see institutions come in in a big way. And I think that'll have a very material impact on the price. What happens and what time frame, how much of an impact, that's for everyone to debate. But I do think that that is uh, what, we are, uh, what we're starting to see there. Uh, all right. What, uh, what other? Oh, before I forget. Make sure you smash the like button right now so that more people on YouTube can find this content. Super important. That thumbs up button right under the video. Make sure you hit that button. Uh, subscribe to the channel. And then I am putting a URL right now in the chat, pompletter.com. Again, P-O-M-P, pompletter.com. I write an email every single morning to uh, over 60,000 investors now um, all about the uh, business, finance, the economy, Bitcoin, et cetera. So make sure you go get and subscribe to pompletter.com and uh, you can get that content every single morning. Uh, okay, let's talk presidential election. Is Biden a good choice for Bitcoin uh, or tr uh, and obviously Trump? Uh, look, I don't think that either one is going to matter. And what I mean by that is most politicians are exactly the same. They make big promises and they don't fulfill them. 
right? At, at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. Um, obviously, Trump has taken a really strong stand against China. Uh, if you look at somebody like Biden, he probably won't be nearly as strong against it. Uh, if you look at kind of what they're both looking for, uh, the Republican Party in general wants to spend less money. Uh, the Democratic Party want, is okay spending kind of more money. Um, ultimately, I, I don't think it's going to matter, right? If you look at um, the, the last six fiscal years in the United States, we have collected more income tax revenue every single year for six years. So the the income or the revenue of the government is going up. But at the same time, the deficit is going up, which means that they are increasing their spending faster than they're increasing their revenue. It's a bad business model, right? But what ends up happening is they keep taking more money from you and I. Uh, ultimately, for Bitcoin, I don't think it's going to matter. Uh, I don't think that there's any sort of ban of Bitcoin or anything like that going to happen. Uh, it is a fully decentralized system that can't be shut down. And I think what you're going to end up seeing is you're going to end up seeing um, either one of those people step in. There's going to be a lot of spending, right? Republicans want to spend a trillion dollars. Democrats want to spend $3 trillion. Uh, It's going to continue to devalue the dollar, weaken the dollar. You're going to see people fleeing for inflation hedge assets still over the next kind of two to three years. Um, and things like Bitcoin, gold, real estate, and even stocks to some degree uh, will continue to, uh, to kind of benefit from that. But that's not a political thing. That's not, you know, somebody is a, a president and therefore that's the impact on the market. The bigger structural kind of more important uh, trend is the fact that the Federal Reserve uh, understands that the United States economy is now addicted to monetary stimulus. We have to have a low rate environment and we have to have massive amounts of monetary uh, stimulus. If we don't have that quantitative easing, uh, literally the economy gyrates and, and, and will break. Um, and, and so I don't think that we're going to see us coming out of a zero rate environment for a long period of time. Uh, and I do think that we'll see uh, for sure in 2020, another uh, very large monetary stimulus package. You know, Again, I've kind of pegged it at uh, over $2 trillion for sure. Um, and, uh, and then we'll see what happens in 2021. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, any advice on getting into a career in tech investing with an econ and finance background? Uh, a lot of people don't know this. I actually have an economics degree. Um, and uh, then obviously on the tech side, uh, Daniel. So here's three tips uh, that I always tell people when it comes to jobs. Uh, one, it's who you know. Two, it's the work product you created. And three is uh, it also comes down to what you're willing to do uh, to get in in the door. And so what I mean by that is one, who do you know? Uh, things like Twitter are incredibly valuable on the tech investing side, right? So uh, being able to uh, learn, what are these people talking about? What are they focused on? Uh, what have they invested in? All that kind of stuff. Uh, two is you also can communicate with them. So you're able to uh, tweet at them, you're able to DM them, all that kind of stuff. So, so one is who do you know? Uh, two is what can you do, right? Or what have you done? Uh, I, I think resumes are stupid at this point, right? So if you want to get a job in tech investing, here's what I would do. I would literally go and I would say, all right, what are the investment themes that I think are interesting? Um, let's say that I decided uh, 3D manufacturing was going to be interesting because we're going to have to reshore a bunch of uh, manufacturing and supply chains, and therefore 3D manufacturing is going to play a big part in that to keep the labor costs down and, and to continue to kind of drive efficiency while improving the resiliency of a business. So that's my overarching theme. I'm going to go find a bunch of 3D manufacturing businesses. I'm going to talk to the CEOs or talk to people at the companies. I'm going to read up as much as I can. I'm going to create investment memos on, let's say, the five best companies. Uh, and then I'm also going to write a three to five page summary of the 3D manufacturing industry. Right now, why would I do all that work? Because then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to literally send it to every single tech uh, investor that I know. And I'm going to say, hey, I don't know. I have never worked at a tech investment firm. I've got an economics and a finance degree. I think that this is super interesting though. I would love to break into the industry in order to show what I'm capable of. I've gone out, I've researched a sector. I've written a thesis on why this sector should be a positive place to focus on in the future. And on top of that, I've gone out and I found the five most interesting companies I could find. And I wrote an investment thesis on all five of them. Here's the information. Feel free to use it. Even if I don't get the job, just thought you would find it interesting. If you've got uh, opportunities on your team, please let me know. I'd love to have a conversation. You will get more meetings that way than sending a resume. Absolutely. And what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to prove the quality of your work. And so if you're good, people will jump. They'll literally, you know, they'll compete over each other to hire you. If you're not good, then they won't. And so ultimately what it comes down to is just what's the body of work that you can do? So can you get in touch with people? Can you communicate with them? Can you build relationships? And then what is the actual quality of the work? Um, and, and so I think that being able to showcase that work, right? If you said to me, hey, I want to be a salesman um, you know, at a software company, I'd say, great, you should show up to the interview and you should have three leads for them. 
And those leads, you should have already talked to the companies and said to them, hey, I'm going for an interview at this company. I think it'd be super interesting. If I can get someone from their team to jump on the phone with you, would you guys take the meeting? And if the prospect says yes, then great. You go to the meeting and literally I would bring a piece of paper and I would say, hey, you know, I really want to be a salesman here, but before we start the meeting, uh, I've already done the work. I've already been able to prospect three leads. Those three leads, here's all the information that I have on them. And here's the individual and the contact information of the people who at that company who would like to take a meeting with you. Well, now it's not a question of, can you do the job? You already did the job. You already proved you could do the job before you even had the job. So of course, they're going to be interested in potentially hiring you. So you can use that same mechanism over and over again, uh, depending on what the role is that you're looking to go get. Um, and then in, in terms of the last point is just what are you willing to actually do? Uh, many people want to come in. They want to be a partner on day one, right? They want to be the head of sales on day one. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, if you're young, if you don't have experience in an industry, you got to eat shit for a while. And, uh, and that's not a bad thing, right? Uh, that's how you learn. Um, and so I think that you've just got to be able to be humble enough to say, look, I'll do whatever you guys want, right? Whatever you need, uh, for the better kind of good of the team, I'm here. I want to work, you know, put, put me to work and, and doing whatever the tasks are that, that you need. And what you find is by having that mentality and being able to be successful and doing whatever the team needs, they'll keep giving you more responsibility. So if you're, if you're end up, uh, being successful at task one, then they give you a second task, then a third task, then a fourth task, then a fifth one. And every time it gets a little bit bigger, a little bit more important, a little bit more, um, intricate and, and complex. And I think that's really what you eventually want to get to is you want to be able to get to the point where uh, they know, hey, if we give him something to do uh, or her something to do, then uh, they'll just get it done. So that uh, that makes sense. Um, this dude could sell Kias. I can sell anything, man. It's not that hard to sell. All you got to understand is I'm trying to solve somebody else's problem, of course. Um, let's see here. Uh, what do I think about Dave Portnoy getting in the game? Uh, look. Dave Portnoy is, uh, is a star, obviously. Um, he understands uh, exactly how media works. He saw this way before most people. Um, he's built an incredible company. You know, Back in March 2017, I wrote a piece when the company was valued at $15 million. And I said, this is going to be a billion-dollar business. They're at $450 million today. I have no doubt that it's going to be a billion-dollar business. Uh, ultimately, they've got a highly loyal and engaged fan base. Uh, he really, really has his pulse on kind of what the audience wants. Um, they continue to make bold um, bets uh, that pan out, right? They just signed Deion Sanders uh, from the NFL Network. Um, so things like that, I think you, you got to be bold. You got to be innovative. You got to be willing to disrupt yourself a little bit uh, in order to continue to grow. And uh, both him and Eric and Ardini are willing to do that. Uh, I saw today the video, you know, I, I tweeted and said it's laugh out loud funny uh, seeing Cameron, Tyler, and Dave all, uh, all talking about Bitcoin. Um, you know, it, it's ultimately a good thing, right? I, I tend to think awareness is, uh, is pretty important. Uh, I thought Cameron Teller did a great job uh, explaining Bitcoin to uh, to Dave. And uh, look, once you get some skin in the game like Dave has now, looks like he bought kind of six figures worth of Bitcoin. Um, you, know, you start paying attention, and so we'll see kind of how it plays out. But I think that uh, uh, nat naturally, it's a pretty uh, uh, pretty positive thing. Uh, Pomp, would you invest in a pseudonymously run company? Um, I've talked to a uh, a few founders that basically aren't uh, using their real names. Um, I personally have no problem with it. Uh, when we think about it from a, uh, a, an institution or a fund level, uh, it becomes a little bit harder, uh, especially because we have things like public pensions and audits and things like that. Um, so still trying to figure that one out. But uh, I, I do think that... Um, uh, it's, it's pretty cool to see. And, and, you know, look, kind of a, a thread on this is uh, I believe that decentralization is going to become absolutely essential. So if you look at things like TikTok, if tech, TikTok had decentralized infrastructure and decentralized ownership, there wouldn't be a, co a conversation right now about banning it. Um, but obviously the, there's centralization and therefore there's that threat. Um, I think that decentralization is going to be uh, important not only for money, for the financial system, uh, for organizations, for, uh, you know, what would have been corporations, all that kind of stuff. I also believe um, that pseudon uh, pseudonymity, I guess, um, and anonymity is going to become um, a, a great advantage. I don't think it's necessarily going to become essential, uh, but I do think that people who are able to, whether it's create content, do things, um, and do it pseudonymously, they will uh, eventually end up actually having a, uh, a, a, a advantage in certain cases. And so uh, definitely two things that um, I am uh, I'm interested in is, uh, one, the, uh, the decentralization, and then two, is the uh, the pseudonymity or uh, anonymity? Um, all right, I'm going to uh, stick around for uh, for two or three more minutes. What uh, 
what, what else? Am I investor at Bank to the Future? No, I am not. Uh, any thoughts on crypto and real estate market? Uh, I already kind of touched on that. So just go back and watch the video. Um, am I worried about having a DeFi bubble? Yeah, listen, it, it, you, you got to be kidding me with uh, uh, this stuff. I haven't paid super, super close attention, but like the yams and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's one of these situations where uh, ultimately what we're seeing in DeFi today is uh, is two uh, trends, right? The first is there's a lot of technology being built. There's not a lot of products being built. What I mean by that is everyone's trying to basically impress each other with, oh, look at what I made the technology do. But the products aren't usable for a mass audience. And therefore, uh, you're going to have to get another iteration, right? That's not necessarily a bad thing. You have to be able to build the technology first, and then you got to be able to build a usable product on top of it. But right now, we're still in the technology phase. So lots of people are building all this kind of crazy stuff. And if you're really, really committed, if you're really interested in this stuff, if you're technical, you can go and you can play with all the intricacies of it, but they're not usable products. So for the most part, it's technology is not a product. You got to get to products in order to get adoption. Uh, the second thing is, it's a lot of financial engineering. So if I go and I take you know money and I put it into a CDP and I take out, you know, uh, some high percentage uh, of a collateralized loan. And then I go and I put it in a second CDP and do it again and again and again. Like that's not really anything other than financial engineering. Um, and so when you look at a lot of these things, uh, again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's plenty of financial engineering that goes on the legacy markets or whatever. Um, but, but it's just kind of, you got to call it what it is. And, and so uh, is that a bubble? Is it not I don't know. I haven't paid enough attention to know, like, are we at the top of the bubble? Uh, but I definitely think that things uh, obviously are frothy. Um, and when things get frothy, uh, there's usually some kind of corrections, right? And so um, I don't know if comparing it to the ICO bubble in uh, 16 and 17 is, is fair. Um, but, but I do think that um, that there's a kind of a lot of talk and, and excitement, uh, but I don't think I've necessarily seen the products yet that, that uh, can kind of fulfill that. Not a bad thing, just kind of my assessment of it. And so uh, I think over time though, you will see um, uh, a lot of decentralized uh, finance applications, right? Bitcoin is a DeFi application. Um, you, you'll see a bunch of them get built uh, and, and the world needs them. So, you know, all good uh, on that front. Um, did I go to college? Yes, I went to Bucknell University and I uh, got an economics degree. Um, hey, Pomp, do you think putting 50% of your net worth into Bitcoin is too much? I just started working one and a half years ago. It's not much money on the sidelines for sure. My for sure, emergency money excluded. Uh, yeah, again, look, I can't give financial advice. Uh, what I can tell you is what I did. I did 50% um, in December of 2018, I think it was. Um, and uh, my whole thought process was just, I, I picked in a number that I was willing to lose and not lose sleep over, um, but at the same time would have a material impact if things went well. Uh, as many people know, I don't really believe in diversification. Uh, I'm a big believer in high conviction bets with concentration. Uh, I'm also young. I'm 32 years old, so uh, I've got quite a bit of time ahead of me in terms of if something goes wrong, uh, but that's just kind of how I thought about it. Uh, I, I usually tell people for most part, uh, people, if you want to invest in Bitcoin, uh, I would say the, uh, the most popular percentages I see are still like one to 5%. Uh, they kind of look at it as like a, a risk asset. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's kind of how I look at allocation. Um, all right, two more questions. Let's go. What do we got here? Uh, are financial institutions like banks going to use Bitcoin? Of course, the OCC announcement uh, just made it okay for them to custody Bitcoin. Um, we just saw uh, MicroStrategy, the uh, publicly traded NASDAQ company's $1.2 billion market cap. They took $250 million off their balance sheet and they bought Bitcoin. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of as a uh, reserve asset or treasury reserve asset. Um, and I think that uh, absolutely you're going to see that um, with banks just as much as you're going to see with every other company as well. So I think that um, is, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see. <laughs> How is married life? That's a good one to uh, end on. Married life is great. Polina and I are, uh, are having a lot of fun. Uh, we actually, I think it was uh, one month uh, on the 11th. So, uh, the first month down, uh, got no complaints. I think, um, you know, we, we're excited. It's a little weird to get married during the uh, pandemic. Uh, it's a little weird to not really kind of be able to celebrate with all your friends and family. Um, but, uh, but so far so good. We're enjoying it. And, uh, if you got wedding advice, then, uh, email me, DM me, whatever you got, tweet at me. Uh, I'll take all the advice I got because, uh, you know, never done this before. So, uh, that should be good. But, all right, I'm losing my voice, so 
I got to get the hell out of here. Uh, before I do that, a couple of housekeeping items. Smash the like button, that thumbs up. Please, please, please hit that thumbs up so that more people on YouTube can find this content. Um, make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. I just dropped in the chat a URL. That URL is to pompletter.com every single morning. So here's the deal on the pomp letter. Uh, every single morning I wake up, I go through the news, I pick a topic that I think is interesting and worth talking about. And then I basically write my personal opinion. I break down the topic. Uh, sometimes they're super long, sometimes they're short, but I try to basically say, here's what happened in the situation. Here's my personal perspective on it. Here's why I think it's important. Here's what I think is going to happen. So that can be everything from asset prices to markets, um, to looking at individual companies, um, to things like Bitcoin, whatever it is, business, economy, uh, finance, and Bitcoin, please, please go subscribe, pompletter.com. Uh, I really enjoy doing it. Uh, it's awesome when people email back and kind of share their opinion as well. So pompletter.com, go do it. Smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you guys later.